Amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise today. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo. God is good. Amen. Oh, man. So this uh, next song, it's a... I was telling, it's so funny when we, uh, Elizabeth and I have conversations, it's like, uh, this is a, probably going to be a new song to you, but it's not really a new song. <laughs> and I was like, we used to do it in Stephenville all the time. And uh, she was like five or six, seven years old in Stephenville. So she's like, I don't remember it much that we did in Stephenville. <laughs> but uh, I just had this song on my heart from last night. I was just uh, sitting around and just thinking about all the good things the Lord has done. And uh, this song is called, I Will Worship You for Who You Are. So hopefully uh, you know it. If you don't, it, it, it uh, it's pretty easy to learn. So it just says this. Standing here in your presence, thinking of the good things you have done. Waiting here patiently. Just to hear your still small voice again, holy, righteous, faithful to the end, Savior, healer, redeemer, and friend, and I will worship Just to hear your still small voice again, holy, righteous, faithful to the end, Savior. Jesus, I 
worship Him for who He is. Amen. Who is He to you today? Amen. Just tell Him today, Lord, your Savior, your friend, your Redeemer. Oh, you're so much to us, God. You're everything to us. And we just say thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. At the cross.
the day, amen. My soul secure, your promise sure, your love is yours, always. I will worship you for who you are, I will worship Praise the Lord. You can be seated, you guys. I want to encourage you. Would you just slip your hands up to heaven? Let's just worship him once more together. We love you. We praise you, our God. You are masterful, and you are in control of every part of our lives. We adore you, King and Savior. Pray that you would affirm yourself in a very rich and meaningful way to every individual. You already have. Just to know that, that you assigned names and locations to every star, that they all beckon to your command, that everything's going to be okay. Everything is in your hand. Our nation is in your hands. This world is in your hands. Father, together we want to lift up some requests. We pray for Larry Workman. Um, you guys, Larry and, and Dale, are off on a camping trip. He's had some work done recently with just removing places on his face and got a very concerning call from the doctor. He has to have a visit um, this week. And he's concerned about it. I want us to pray for Larry right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we step into his shoes. What would it feel like? Oh, God. We love our brother. Bring so much confidence into his spirit and into his heart right now that you are daddy God and that you are in control. Thank you that you're our healer. Father, bring confidence, let it just well up inside of him. 
we expect you to do great things, Lord. We expect that he is whole. We expect that there's a good report. And our eyes are on you, Jesus. And our Father, we just continue to lift up Carlos and Alba in their loss. Help this dear, precious family. Oh, God, we, we step into their shoes this morning. What would it feel like, God? Help them. Encourage them. Strengthen them, oh, God. Let them feel the love of their church family surrounding them, we pray. Oh, hallelujah to your name. Pastor Mo, just once more, I will worship you for who you are. Can we all sing it together? course I just think it'd be appropriate mm. as we we're just yeah. praying healer amen only righteous faithful to the end savior healer redeemer and friend I will worship you for who you are I will worship you worship for to the word this morning, I want to just encourage you to continue to pray for Diana as she faces uh, possibly some more eye surgery. Um, Paul's wife, Janice, is having some more testing this week. Pray for Janice. And uh, also, please continue to pray for the Nelson family. They've experienced loss as well. We could name a dozen other requests, you guys. There's so much uh, need for our church family, but we serve a God who is faithful and capable. Amen? Well, um, I want to just uh, mention to you that um, if, you, if you have not figured it out yet, there's different ways for... Um, <clears throat> how did it get all the way there? Okay. <laughs> Having some clicker problems this morning. Okay, but... Uh, there's ways that you can connect with us, 602-833-0075. Just text the word CONNECT to that phone number. If you're new, if you're watching us online, we welcome you. We encourage you to go to the website and, and just uh, find out um, more about us and, and get connected. And if, um, in particular, if you have a prayer need, we'd love to know that. Um, Especially if you invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, we want to know that. We, we welcome you to join with us. We've got some first steps you can take and some healthy things you can do. Um, but you can donate at uh, bfachurch.org. You can use Church Center app. And uh, we just, we, we welcome all of you. I want to say a prayer over the message, also over the offering list, bow our heads. Father, we just thank you for the chance that we have for giving. We pray that you bless the kingdom and continue to ad advance it and let it prosper. Take care of every financial need of our church family, oh God. Bless them and encourage them and, and let good news happen for them in the name of Jesus. And uh, we do just thank you so much for it. And I pray that the, the message this morning will resonate in our hearts in a very special way. 
and you will bring us closer to you, God, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Hey, just a quick update before we get into the Word. Um, we continue with our renovation project. Here's the latest news. We are going to be meeting in this room today and at least the next three Sundays, okay? So four Sundays more. Probably, I'm going to just be straight up, probably five Sundays. It's a huge job that's going on. But um, we're, good. we're so thankful that we have space to meet. It's comfortable. We have comfortable chairs. And uh, when we do reopen our worship center, we're going to have a, a soft reopening, sort of not a grand opening, but we're going to celebrate the accomplishments with a very special day out there. It's going to be so worth it. So just reach around there, pat yourself on the back. You've been doing such a good job being patient. Just continue to pray for patience right now. Amen. Okay. So, well, the message this morning is entitled The Jesus Boat, All Aboard That's Going Abroad. Um, abroad means uh, that we're going somewhere. All aboard means get on the boat if you're going. And all, uh, all who are going abroad means that we're going to a destination. On the Jesus boat, we're not just taking a spin around the lake. We're headed somewhere. We've got a destination and a purpose in mind. Um, we're going on a boat ride this morning. I hope it's better than uh, what I experienced as a, a preteen. Uh, in fact, I, my goodness, I was way earlier than that. I wasn't even in the first grade yet, but I remember our Sunday school class at Oakland Assembly of God Church in Bellmead, Texas. And our Sunday school teacher promised, now next Sunday, we're going to go on a bear hunt. Man, I got all excited. We're going to go hunt bears. And um, come to find out, she just started talking and said, we're walking through the woods right now. And, and can you hear the bear? And I was so disappointed. You know, as a little boy, I thought we were going to go catch a bear. But uh, this morning, we're not literally getting in a boat. But we are going to go on a boat ride on the Jesus boat. And I want to share scripture with you this morning. By the way, that's a, a picture that I will, <clears throat> I'll say more about in just a moment. But Mark chapter 1 reads like this. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, his son, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw Jesus, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Can you just see them waving goodbye to Dad as they're leaving their boat and they're following Jesus? They left their boats, they left their safety zone. And then Mark chapter 3, when they heard all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him and to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. So they left their boat, and now they're starting to get in the boat with Jesus, so to speak. Um, it's a new boat. It's a different boat from what they're used to. There is a paradigm shift happening. And um, also, interestingly, it's a natural amphitheater because you've got him getting in the water. The water acts as an amplifier. The mountains up behind uh, make a, a shell, and his voice can, can, pro can project um, to, um, to, the, to the audience. Now, one time when Jesus and his disciples um, were in a boat out on the Sea of Galilee, there was an incredible storm. In fact, a couple of different times you read of these storms, but Mark chapter 4 tells about this, 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let's go over to the other side. Just stop right there. Whenever Jesus says, let's go to the other side, you're going to go to the other side. It doesn't matter what you have to go through to get there. You will go to the other side. Now, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. 
a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. And Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you even care if we drown? He got up and rebuked the wind. And I like to say it this way, he rebuked the wind. He could have rebuked the disciples, right? Who do you think you are telling me, you know, but he didn't rebuke them. He rebuked the winds. And in fact, the wording that he uses for the wind is the same wording that he uses when he casts out demons in other places. Quiet. Be still. So there's a real uh, spiritual overtone to this. And then the wind died down. It was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And we could be all holy and sanctimonious. We could say, well, if it if had been me there, I would have just said, don't you understand? This is the fulfillment of prophecy and blah, blah, blah. I think we would have all been freaked out a little bit if he stood up and calmed the wind and the wave, just like them. Now, about the Sea of Galilee, it is true that storms come up very fast and uh, out of nowhere. However, not in this part of the lake. There's two points I'm going to share this morning. Here's the first one. What were they doing in a storm in the first place? Um, the storms usually don't happen in this part of the Sea of Galilee. It's a, a nice tucked away lake and you don't have to even worry about big waves. I'm gonna show you a little video. This is, um, this is the Jesus boat. And uh, how many of you were alive back in 1986? Let me see your hands. Okay, so 90% of our audience was alive in 86. This happened in your lifetimes. Uh, go ahead and turn that light off if you would so we can see a little bit better, thanks. And uh, this is two men that were brothers and they, um, it's all right, Daryl, you're just fine, thank you, we're good, just fine. And uh, two brothers that were, um, that were walking along the Sea of Galilee because the, the lake had, um, there was a severe drought and they had lost like two foot of water. It went way down, maybe even more than that. And they were amateur archeologists and they're walking along the seashore and, and uh, they're looking for coins and things like that. And they happened to look down and they saw some iron nails and reached down and picked one of them up. And then they started gathering some things and they realized they saw the form of a boat underneath the, the surface of the water buried in the mud. And so, they had the good sense to call the Israel uh, Antiquities Authority, and, and they came on the scene, and, and for two weeks, solid, 24 hours a day, they're digging mud away from this ancient boat, and uh, they put plaster around it, and finally were able to float it to safety, and then uh, went through this painstaking process of preserving the wood that was decaying, and, and eventually it, it gets put on display, and uh, they've done different tests several times. They've tested for radiocarbon, and they've determined that this boat is 2,000 years old, that it was the boat that was identical to what Jesus would have used when he was zipping back and across uh, the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Galilee, and that um, it held about a dozen uh, men, maybe 13 people could fit in a boat this size. And uh, we can't say for sure that Jesus used this exact boat. Of course, there were hundreds of them. But it very quickly became known as the Jesus boat. And that is a huge archaeological discovery, and it happened in your lifetimes, you guys. 2,000 years this thing was buried. And then the water goes down, and then in, in uh, 86 they found it. And then in 2009, a mile from there, they discovered the other thing that I mentioned a few weeks back, the uh, synagogue in the town of Magdala, the, the home synagogue of Mary Magdalene, the one that was delivered of so many demons. And it, it just confirmed so many things. There were liberal people saying that, well, the Bible, you know, it, um, it isn't true because it says that Jesus did ministry in the synagogues and there were no synagogues in Galilee. And uh, so it's none of it's true. 
Uh, in fact, they thought of Galilee as sort of backwater, you know, backwoods people. And they are not sophisticated. And they don't even have synagogues there. Don't even, but, of course, they do. But if you don't mind to go ahead, thanks, sweetheart. Turn the lights back on. Um, so here's a, a quote from Yair Amakai. He's a Jewish scholar. He lives in this area where the Jesus boat is. And here's the exact quote. The very beginning of the test of the occasion is, why do they have a storm to begin with? This is not a very wide boat. Wide boats would be in a very wavy area, so this is almost a big canoe. It is little. There are not big waves over here. This is in the middle of the valley. The very beginnings is like they had a storm which causes the time for Jesus to put down and walk on the water and calm the storm. That's the narrative. So here's a guy who lives there who says, look, trust me, in this part of the lake, you don't have massive waves. You don't have big storms. That's why they were in such a small boat. But sometimes Jesus allows us to go into storms. And sometimes Jesus does it just for the fact that he will calm the storm. Sometimes he calms the storm. Sometimes he calms his child in the storm. But he always brings his calm. And so uh, in Mark 5, no, we're not going to read verses from there. You can on your own. But we see Jesus crisscrossing the Sea of Galilee in the boat back and forth. As soon as he gets out of the boat, he's doing ministry. Uh, the demoniac is delivered. Uh, he gets back in the boat. As soon as he gets out, a dead girl is raised to life, and an unclean woman is cured, and they get back in the boat. It's important to see what happens at the end of chapter 6. The setting is so important. Verse 30, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So, verse 32, they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. They've got to be thinking, ah, finally, we get to have some rest. We've been so busy in ministry. Uh, we finally get to have a little R&R. &R. But as often is the case in ministry, and you know this, they didn't get to enjoy any rest. You know, they planned to go for some solitude, but actually the crowds followed them. I remember one time Stephanie and I uh, were invited to a, a trip to Las Vegas. We've never been to Las Vegas. We, um, we don't believe in gambling, so we kind of avoid it. Although I understand there's uh, great family places there too, you know. And um, so we were excited about going and uh, it was with a, a lot of presbyters who were meeting there from our region. And then um, something uh, ministry-wise came up very important in the church, and of course we canceled that trip. And then I remember another time we were on vacation. This time is when we were in uh, Colorado, and we came down to visit uh, Stephanie's parents. When, when you're cheap, you go on vacation to the in-laws, even in August in, in Phoenix, right? And so, so we, came, uh, we came for vacation, but even while we're on vacation, there was an emergency, and I had to book it back up to Colorado, and then uh, continue the vacation after that. That's just sometimes that's the way it happens in ministry. I can relate to the disciples. I bet they thought, man, it would sure be nice to have a little downtime. But look at this, verse 33. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot uh, from all around the towns and got there ahead of them. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, and as his disciples came to him, they said, this is a, a remote place. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Now just picture this, we were supposed to go on retreat we were headed for a getaway, and we've been with you ministering all day, but now this enough is enough, Lord. Send them home, and, and they need to go somewhere and get something to eat. 
the truth is we need to go somewhere and get something to eat. That's really what's going on. And Jesus says to them, but he answered, you give them something to eat. Oh, what? And of course, this is the feeding of the 5,000. Um, I'm not even going to read those verses because that's not really what we're focusing on. But Mark reminds us that, that they were all so tired. They had already been ministering to people. Now they're going on retreat. And, uh, and yet, the greatest harvest ever happened. 5,000 men, plus the women and children were not even included in that count. And uh, they are fed by just five little, tiny, uh, small loaves and a couple of fish. But here's the kicker when you get down to verse 45. Immediately, this is... This is right after the feeding of the 5,000. No break. Immediately, that's one of Mark's favorite words. And Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida. So they get back in the boat, and he dismissed the crowd. And after leaving them, he went on a mountainside to pray. And I'll bet they're thinking, okay, well, we get to go on retreat. He's going to keep on ministering. We're going to go on retreat. But later that night... The boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land and he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them. I've often wondered, where was he going? I, he was just going to pass them right by if they didn't reach out to him. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. I just love their honesty and their vulnerability. Oh my goodness, it's a ghost. Ah! They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. And look at this word. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them. Aren't you glad when you're in a storm and Jesus climbs into the boat? And the wind died down. And they were completely amazed. This word for amazed has um, some connotations with it. They're, they're amazed in a good sense. They're also amazed in a confused way for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Here's the deal, second point. It's his voyage. It's his. You were in a storm, you invited him into the boat, granted, but it's his boat. <laughs> it's his voyage. And now, once he gets in the boat, our attitude needs to be, I'm just along for the ride. I get to enjoy the voyage. You, you invited him in. There's this beautiful thing called free will. We get to invite him into our heart. We find him, but really, he's been setting us up to find him alone. It was his idea the whole time. He's been drawing us and wooing us, and we have to choose him, yes. But once we choose him, it's, it's his boat, it's his voyage. Um, this, this is a picture on the left of Richard Sanders. He passed away in January of this year. And then um, on the right, it's a picture of Congressman Jeb Hensarling, um, who spoke at um, Richard's funeral. And Richard Sanders was a judge in Athens, Texas, known to be a, a kind Christian man, um, kind to people, good-hearted man, loved the Lord. And one of the things that he was infamous for was that um, locally Satanists Satanist, uh, boycotted the nativity scene. They wanted the nativity scene taken down from, uh, from the courthouse. And boy, something inside of Richard just stood up and just snapped and said, how dare you? You were not going to take down the nativity scene. And I mean, boy, the people rallied and... and um, Wonderful Christian man. Uh, Jeb Hinserling served uh, a more than a decade in Congress. He uh, was over, he was chair of several committees 
good friend of, of uh, Richard. And um, he came down for his funeral. And this story comes uh, from my brother Tim. Tim a uh, longtime radio personality and had, had interviewed Richard Sanders and Richard was a friend uh, for, for years. And he told me how Jeb at the funeral told the story about, you know, Richard loved to fish. And one time I came from DC and came down uh, to East Texas and, and uh, Richard had set up a, a fishing trip for us. He said, you know, I'm not much of a fisherman, but I enjoy it. But um, I walked out on, on his dock and I got in his boat and I used his fishing rod and reel. We went out on the water, I used his bait, put it down in the, in the water and I caught a bass, a nice side, big mouth bass. And I pulled it up, I was just so proud and he said, as I was holding that bass, I had the thought, somehow, I don't know how, but Richard figured this thing out. He put his bass on my line. <laughs> but he just said, you know, he was just that kind of a guy. But that's us. It's his boat. It's Jesus' boat. It's his voyage. We get to journey with him. And, and look at these words here immediately he spoke to them. We're looking at the same words again. Just emphasize it. Just think of this. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And he steps into the boat. And their hearts were hardened. They didn't really understand what was going on. How's that possible? How is it possible? 5,000 people get fed. It's a miracle. Five loaves and two fish. What do you mean you don't understand? Come on, disciples, get your act together. Get with it. Well, what that looks like is when a church begins to grow enormously and exponentially, people sort of go, well, but this isn't the way I thought it would look. This isn't the way I thought it would happen. I always pictured it being this way, and it feels differently. I have the sense in my heart that God is getting ready for Buckeye First Assembly to go through an enormous season of growth. We're, we're putting in place parameters and, and uh, systems that are desperately needed. But don't let the miracle become something that in your heart you go, well, I don't know if I am in. I don't know if this is the way I looked at it. This isn't what I signed up for. It's not quite what I pictured. That's what was going on in the disciples' hearts. So I remember that there were about 13 people could fit in the Jesus boat. I wonder if that's why he chose 12 disciples. No, I'm being facetious. I know he had a plan way bigger than that. But, you know, in our lead team for BFA, we've, we've got about that many in our Jesus boat, in our BFA Jesus boat. And I just pray that God helps us to always, always be looking for, always be forward looking, always be thinking, how can, how can we reach our grandkids for Jesus? How, what would it take for the youth of our culture to be on fire for God, and I mean just absolutely going after Jesus with all their heart. Would the service look a little different? Maybe, possibly. Wouldn't it be worth it if there was such a genuine move of God that lives were changed? Uh, Mark chapter 8 is interesting because the Pharisees, they start to question him, and they're testing him, and they're saying, give me a sign from heaven. And Jesus, you can just hear his frustration. It says he sighed deeply. <sighs> a, a sign? You want a sign? I just fed 5,000 people. That wasn't good enough for you. This generation is always looking for a sign. And look at this, verse 13. Um, well, I forgot this part of the end of six. When they crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. They anchored it. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. Interesting. They're on this boat ride, continually doing ministry. Here's chapter eight, though. He left them. He got back into the boat. He crossed to the other side. And the disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf that they had with them in the, in the boat. So just picture how comical this is. The 12 disciples riding in the boat with Jesus and they forgot bread. 
And Jesus hears the conversation and he says, verse 15, be careful, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And they discussed it with one another and said, it is because we have no bread. Can't you just see it? Hey, James, what's he talking about? Yeast of the Pharisees. What's this, you know, the bread of Herod? What in the world is he talking about? I think he's saying we forgot to bring bread. It just Sometimes with the disciples, there's so much just like you and me. It just goes right over their head. They didn't, they didn't catch it. And aware of this discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about bread? What are you guys doing? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes to see but fail to see and ears to hear? And you don't remember when I broke the five loaves and, fi and, and for the 5,000? And how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. I mean, this is hilarious. See, Jesus, we are paying attention. There were twelve. Twelve baskets. And Jesus says, and when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, separate miracles, separate feeding, separate bread and fish miracle. How many baskets full did you pick up? And they answered, seven. And you can sort of hear the tone of their voice. No, we get it. We're paying attention. It was 12 the first time, seven the next time. We don't have any bread in the boat. And, and he said to them, now, you've got to get this because to me, the most powerful part of this verse is not the wording, but what, what must have happened that is treated as silent here. He said to them, look, he said to them, do you still Still not understand. You guys are worried about not bringing bread. You've got the bread of life in the boat with you. How can you be worried about not having bread? Well, this, this message winds us down to this. Here's, here's the big idea. Look at your neighbor and say, what's the big idea? Here's the big idea. Hey, church, need a lift? It's not that big of a shift. Catch my drift? What I mean is the Jesus boat wasn't huge. It was a small canoe-like vessel. And John gives us the beautiful picture of what it looks like when you're in the Jesus boat. Now remember that in John chapter 21, Jesus has died, he's been in the tomb, now he has risen from the dead, and they keep seeing him at different times. But in verse three, we read from, uh, about Peter, I'm going, to, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. By the way, some, some scholars interpret this, that he was leaving ministry, I'm done with ministry, I'm going back to my previous occupation. I have never read it that way. I think that he's just, hey, I'm gonna go fishing. And they all said to him, we'll go with you. So they went out and they got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. And he called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Now, I think it's powerful that they're in a small boat. It's, it's not a massive war-going ship where they move from one school of fish to another school of fish. No, it's like the net's right here and let's just 
throw it over there. Or I guess, it, yeah, it'd be opposite of what I just did. Well, it's not that big of a shift. Catch my drift? It's, it's really, it's about obedience. It's not really about where they're fishing. Although I have an amazing story. When I lived in Colorado, I earned a nickname because I went ice fishing with Alan and Steve. And we had three holes cut in the ice. They were about 18 inches apart. Mine was in the middle. Steve's over here jigging, and he's just pulling up rainbow trout left and right. Alan over here, 18 inches away, rainbow trout, boom, just yanking them in so fast they're reaching their limit. I'm there all day, nothing. And finally, at the end of the day, I get one. I'm like, oh, man, I got it. I'm reeling it in. And I pull it out of the hole, and it was a crawdad. And I earned the name Captain Crawdad. You know, really, in, there's not much difference between this side of the boat and that side of the boat. But really, what, what needs to happen is, okay, Jesus, Peter nailed it. Okay, Lord, I, I'm tired, worked all night, haven't caught any fish. But just because it's you saying so, I'm going to obey you and try it on the other side. And, and so sometimes you just tweak things a little bit, and it's about obedience. But you, you, you know, we've, we've got to get along. We've got a diversified team. We've got different views. In that boat, you had 12 disciples. All of them think they're right. All of them have their own views. The goal of a church is not for everybody to look the same, dress the same, have the same opinions, and to follow the same exact precise views. The goal is for people who have common ground to say, well, I see it a little bit differently than you. You bring a different viewpoint to the table, but we are serving the Lord Jesus together. You can reach somebody that I can't reach, and you'll be able to reach somebody that he can't reach, and all of us are pulling more people into the Jesus boat, and there are many other boats traveling with us in a direction got to avoid that yeast of the Pharisees, right? I want to close with prayer, and the prayer is, if you are not saved, to climb into the Jesus boat. And the prayer also is, if you are saved, to say, Lord, is there something that I need to be doing differently? Anything at all, speak to my heart. For some of you, you might be watching right now and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You can know him. You can climb into the Jesus boat right now. I want to pray with you. Father, I just pray for the ones who might be watching online who have not received Christ as Savior. I ask you, Lord, to just confirm to them that this is real and this is right and that you love them and you have a plan for their lives. In this moment, Lord, I confess my sins and I walk away from them. I do a 180, I turn away from them and I follow you. I have faith in you, Lord Jesus. You died on the cross, you rose from the dead, you are coming back soon. I will serve you all the days of my life. I pledge my allegiance to you above all else. I will follow you, Christ Jesus. You are my Lord and you are my Savior. And Father, I also pray for the ones who are saved. Many of us who are saved, many of us in this room are saved. Is there anything that you need to tweak a little bit? Are there any adjustments you need to make? I'm continually, as the pastor of Buckeye First Assembly, praying that prayer, Lord, what do you need to change in me? What do you need to change in us? Help us to be very, uh, very careful to obey you and walk carefully with you. I thank you for the ones who are in the boat already, but maybe they're going through a storm. I pray, King Jesus, that you would just walk across the waves right now and step into the boat. I pray that you would speak to the wind and wave, be still, be quiet and it would happen. Let that happen for every individual that needs your peace. We pray in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior. Amen.
Would you stand with me? With just our voices, I want to ask you to, to sing the song, I Surrender All. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender once more, possibly with hands upraised, I surrender.